chapter 14, two natures. In John's first letter to the church, chapter 1, verse 8 reads, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. John is definitely addressing Christian believers. He is addressing those who have repented and received the forgiveness of God. It would be wonderful if the atonement made us sinless. But as any honest believer knows, this is not the case. We are forgiven and righteous, right with God, and we are no longer accountable for our sins because the atonement is an eternal sacrifice. Even the sins we will commit in the future are paid for in full. But we are not and never will be sinless while we remain in our mortal bodies. Christians still sin. Sin is anything less than perfection. That is anything less than the perfect will of God. A lustful thought, anger without reason, an exaggeration of the facts that become a lie. We cannot live one day without sinning. Paul reassures us that there is no more condemnation from God, nor any power of accusation from Satan because the price has been paid for us in advance and we are free to serve God. Knowing that this letter is addressed to believers makes verse 9 very interesting. John says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us suppose that John had been addressing unbelievers. He would have written differently and said, God is merciful and gracious because mercy and grace are what is needed for our sins to be forgiven. Instead, John uses the words faithful and just. What do faithfulness and justice have to do with forgiveness? The answer is absolutely nothing. Christians have already received mercy and grace and their forgiveness is complete. So what is John trying to tell us by using these words? He is saying that if we are honest to admit that we still sin, then God is faithful and just to keep his promise. God will continue to forgive us and we should have no further problem with condemnation. More evidence. It is not just one scripture in John which convinces me of this. Many other scriptures, for example in Paul's letters to the Galatians and Romans, tell us exactly the same thing. But I should not need Paul to reveal this condition to me, nor should I need any other scriptures to convince me of the fact that I still sin. I need to look no further than my own heart and my daily life. Even though I'm hungering and thirsting for righteousness, even though I know I've grown over the years, I can say the same as Paul when he confessed to the church in Romans 7.19. For the good that I want to do, I do not do. But the evil I don't want to do, I find myself doing. I still have this, this inner conflict after many years, but I am completely free from any condemnation because God is faithful and just to his word and his son Jesus is ever interceding for me at the Father's right hand. Christians cannot sin. In the same letter of John, just 35 verses after our first statement that Christians cannot live without sinning, chapter 3 verse 6 says, Whoever abides in Jesus does not sin. Whoever sins has not seen him, neither have they known him. And in verse 9, Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. John has just clearly told us in chapter 1 that Christians still commit sin. And yet now we have a clear statement that a Christian does not sin. And even more surprisingly, cannot sin. A subtle approach. Once again we see the principle I outlined in the previous chapter being applied by John. There is always more than one side to truth. Truth always contains opposites and contradictions. And if we do not recognise this principle, we have to conclude that one of John's statements is true 
and the other is false. This is, in effect, what many Christians do. However, they cannot confess this outright because they profess to believe that the Bible is all the inspired word of God and therefore there cannot be any falsehood or contradictions in it. So they are forced to take a more subtle approach. They pick out the side of the truth that they find easier to agree with and then they justify the existence of the scriptures that put the opposite side by saying, well, I know that John said that, but what he really meant was... And they have to try and fit the awkward statement into one of their proven doctrines to justify themselves. Alternatively, they may say that we must not take the dead letter of the word, but understand the spirit of what the writer was trying to tell us. And that way, give themselves a license to make the scriptures say almost whatever they want them to say, so they don't offend their doctrines. I'm not saying this in order to be critical or sarcastic in any way, but because I realise the difficulty that people face when they believe that truth can be contained in a single statement. I am just trying to demonstrate the problems that arise from this belief. No reconciliation. How can we reconcile two opposite statements in the Bible? We cannot and we certainly should not. Both opposing statements will always stand up perfectly well on their own without any need for reconciliation. There is always an answer if we look at the coin as a whole and not the contradiction of the two sides. The answer to John's two statements is a simple one. Once we can accept that they are both true statements in themselves, the answer is that each statement is referring to a different nature or character. A Christian is a person who has two completely different characters. The statements of John fit perfectly because one of these characters cannot sin and the other one cannot cease from sin. Let us look at these two characters in detail so that we are in no doubt as to the biblical truth of this. The old nature or character is also known as the Adamic nature because it began with Adam's sin. Every Christian knows that Adam was created without sin but many do not realise that he was also created without a conscience. The tree of conscience. This is obvious when we consider that the tree which God forbade Adam to eat was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil is a perfect definition of the word conscience. The two terms are interchangeable. Adam did not have a conscience, which means he did not have a moral choice. Morality can only come from a knowledge of what is good and what is evil. God did not want Adam to know evil or good because he forbade him access to the tree, the means of obtaining this information. Adam's choice was purely one of obedience or disobedience and nothing at all to do with his definitions of what was good or evil. Obedience. It is not often understood that obedience and disobedience are nothing to do with conscience, morality, good and evil, or right and wrong. Adam was told to be obedient, but he was not being obedient because he knew it was right or moral or good to be obedient, or because his conscience told him to do so. Likewise, when he was a disobedient, he was not doing something which he knew was wrong or evil. Adam had no moral value system of what was right and what was wrong. All he had was God's command, obey don't disobey. No reasons why, no morality at all. Obedience is a separate issue from morality and conscience. I'm at pains to emphasise this point because true Christianity is not to do with morals and conscience. That's the wrong tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Christianity is to do with access to the tree of life, obedience and submission to God's will. Obedience gave Adam access to the tree of life, but when he ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he was cut off from the tree of life. Conscience, the knowledge of good and evil, is actually destructive to Christianity. It gets in the way of simple obedience, because when a person has a knowledge of good and evil, there is no guarantee that their definition of what is good and what is evil will agree with what God considers good and evil. Romans 5, 18 and 19 says that because of one man's disobedience, sin came upon every man. This means that we are born sinners. It does not say that we are born perfect 
and then begin to sin at some later time when we understand, it is the very character that we are born with. and It is our inheritance from our father in the flesh, Adam. Reproduction. A clear teaching throughout the Bible is that everything God created reproduces its own kind. Apple trees produce apples, dogs produce dogs, and if two sinners have a child, they can produce no less or no more than they are themselves, a baby sinner. I suppose that this is not very palatable to our self-image. However, we must realise that it was Adam's sin, not ours, that caused this situation. We only inherit this sin by birth. I must point out that we also sin by choice, but this is another matter. Sin is natural. Any parent will confirm that a child does not need lessons in how to be greedy, selfish or stubborn. These things all come naturally. What we do have to teach our children is that they must be unselfish and obedient. It needs chastisement to implement the necessary changes. This is becoming less and less fashionable in our humanistic society and we are reaping the consequences of a generation of parents who thought that their children would find their own level of behaviour without any need for clear guidance and discipline. From our first instruction and discipline as a child, we learn to control this Adamic nature by making laws and penalties for breaking those laws. Covetousness. I would like to use covetousness as an example. Covetousness is the desire for something which does not belong to us. It is natural to be covetous. Many people would steal if there was no law, no punishment and no shame attached to the offence. It would certainly be a much greater temptation. Covetousness is common to man and no one is free from it. Society helps to curtail this trait in our character by creating laws and penalties. Often it is simply the fear of being found out that stops a person stealing or committing adultery or fulfilling any other desire of the flesh. If what I have written seems judgmental and hard on human nature, then I must refer you to scripture and to the list that Paul gives of the works of the flesh, which is the same as the old nature. Galatians 5.19-21 to says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, partying. To accept that we still have the old nature is to accept that we have the potential for anything on Paul's list. In our hearts. The works are in our heart and character, but the manifestation is in our outward actions. A person may control their actions, but it matters little to God if the work is still in the heart, because it is always the heart that God judges. Unfortunately, many Christians still try to control this old nature with their will. This is not the answer. Strong will can never change our character. It can only suppress the things that we are embarrassed to manifest outwardly. Self can never change self. We may succeed in controlling our outward actions as much as is possible and assume that our heart is pure and that we are holy in character. But this will not solve the problem because self will still be in the heart and that has not been controlled. The Bible gives only one answer to dealing with our self life. It has to die for it can never be controlled or purified. If we forget about the inward and judge ourselves on our outward actions, this is hypocrisy, which is the sin of the Pharisees. The other extreme is people who are honest with themselves and realise that their secret life is far from holy. Naturally, this makes them feel condemned. For 20 years, I fell into the second category. Although I was very good at deceiving other people, I did not like to deceive myself, so I felt a second-class Christian. I was never free from guilt. I would pray and ask God to give me a strong will so that I could overcome my desires and have power over my pride, selfishness and lust. But I never did receive the power to master these secret desires. The new nature. After 20 years of struggle, it dawned on me that God does not repair old natures. 
he gives us a new one. I had always known that the Bible talks of a new birth, but I did not have a personal revelation of it. If, when I was born of the flesh, I inherited the character of Adam, it is obvious that when I was born again of the Spirit, I inherited the character of Christ. What a different nature this is. Paul tells us about it in Galatians 5.22, and he calls it the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. This character is in everyone who is born of God. It is impossible for us not to inherit this character if God is our Father. The two trees. Now we should understand the answer to the two opposing statements that John made. The old Adamic nature cannot be redeemed. It is fallen and always will be. As Jesus says in Matthew 7.18, a corrupt tree cannot produce good fruit. The Adamic nature is a bad tree and will always sin. This, of course, is the bad news. But the good news is this. God, through Jesus, gives us his own nature. Now, this is a different tree. It is not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but the tree of life. And it is perfect and cannot sin. Jesus also said in the same verse that a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. A simple solution. Paul says in Romans 8 verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. These are the two laws that govern our two natures. Such a simple answer and so freeing. And yet from my observation, I honestly feel that the majority of Christians spend most of their efforts trying to control the nature of Adam, believing that it can be improved or controlled instead of forgetting about it and concentrating on feeding their new nature. Walk in the Spirit. Paul's teaching in Galatians 5.16 is that if we walk in the Spirit, our new nature, we will not fulfil the lusts of the flesh, our old nature. Notice he does not say that for Christians the lusts of the flesh just disappear. He says we do not fulfil them. What does this mean? The next verse shows us that there is a daily battle for the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so you cannot do the things that you want. If a person accepts a simple truth that whichever nature we walk in will eventually manifest in our outward lifestyle, then it follows that we can only walk in the nature that we cultivate and feed. This is the secret to a carefree, holy life. Dealing with the roots, we must starve the old nature and feed the new nature. Our behaviour will be a natural consequence of this without any need to strive or ex exercise strength of will. Imagine a father teaching his children about growth by instructing them to try and stretch and to concentrate and to make every effort. We could not imagine any father would be so naive. All he has to do is feed the child each day and the growth will take care of itself. Unfortunately, many Christians are striving to grow spiritually, making every effort to be holy and mature, when all they need is the daily spiritual food, which is the very thing they are neglecting. This is sad enough, but not only are they neglecting to feed the new nature, they also continue to feed the old nature. Over the years, they do learn many doctrines. They learn new formulas and methods for power and fulfilling their own wants, but they never grow in character like their heavenly father. Feeding the old nature. The things that feed our old nature may seem obvious to many Christians. Reading pornography, for example. However, we can become so used to our daily lifestyles that we are not always aware of how much we may be unconsciously feeding the old nature every day. Let me take something that is not sinful of itself, like a newspaper. There is obviously a great range from obscene to good reading, but the majority of daily news is the reporting of evil, scandal, criticism, rumour, or just plain lies. It is certainly always politically biased, and one paper alone can never give the reader the truth. In any case, why would a Christian want to read day after day about murder, rape, political wranglings and immoral escapades, when the Bible tells us in Philippians 4.8, to think on these things, whatsoever things are true, 
honest, just, pure, lovely, and a good report. These qualities do not often find their way into the newspapers. On television, the soap operas are based on people's insatiable desire for gossip and scandal. Television is the greatest propaganda machine this world has ever known. It changes the mindset of whole continents and it is extremely subtle because it works on repetition and over many years. Because of the mass media, whole continents now see the same advertising, the same views and the same standards and we lose our reference for what is correct in God's eyes. Whole communities are being programmed at the same time. And unfortunately, the same thing is happening in the church. As strange doctrines are being presented simultaneously to Christians throughout the world using the modern media. The world has invaded many areas of modern church because the ministers and the congregations have been feeding their old natures. They have believed that self can be compatible with the mind of Christ. And slowly the gospel has been corrupted and become reasonable instead of an offence and a sword. I have singled out the media as only one example, but if we evaluate the time we spend doing worldly things, I say again, not sinful things, against the time we spend actively feeding the new nature, it is not surprising that the moral standards of Christians have declined in the same proportion as the world's. If the church have maintained standards over the past 100 years, the gap between the world and the church will be so wide that it will bring ridicule and persecution. The very effect that Jesus said the cross would have in our society. Stop trying. I want to end this chapter by highlighting a problem that many Christians have when they are challenged with the demands of holiness. They are willing to admit that they still have a covetous or lustful thought life, or that they are selfish or find it hard to forgive their enemies. The problem as they see it is that they do not have a strong will. If only they had more willpower, they think, they would be able to overcome these secret faults. I believe the devil is very happy with this diagnosis. In fact, I believe he suggested it to them in the first place. He will encourage the Christian with thoughts such as try harder, God will help you, or ask God to give you a stronger will. I do not believe the devil is even worried when you pray to God, if you are asking for something that God cannot give you. The devil knows that your efforts to be holy will only make you proud and condemning of others, or if you fail, condemn you. Either way, he is pleased because he has masked the true way to holiness. I'm going to share in the next chapter what I believe and have experienced in my own life and have seen in countless others. The simple fact that you do not need a strong will to be holy. I'm not saying that cultivating a strong will is a bad thing to do. It is good to be disciplined. What I am saying is that our will is not the root of the problem and God's desire is always that we deal with the roots. Any other method will always be counterproductive to the real life that God has planned for us.